Aloha Biochem. In this video, we continue in chapter six and discuss chemical equilibrium. Hello again. This lecture brings us into the topic of chemical equilibrium. In the previous lecture, we dealt with reaction rates, which concern how fast a chemical reaction goes. Equilibrium deals with how far they go. In a reaction, the reactants often don't convert completely into products. There is a point at which the reaction stops and the amount of product material levels off. And that point at which the reaction seems to stop is called equilibrium. We'll see that it doesn't really stop. What's going on is the reverse reaction begins to occur as well. And the forward reaction and the reverse reaction, those effects kind of cancel each other off and so it seems to stop. Let's look at a, a simple case, which is a physical reaction, the vaporization of water. So what we'll do here is we'll imagine we're doing an experiment. Let's pour some water into an empty Erlenmeyer flask and then cork it off. And for simplicity's sake, let's assume that there's nothing else in the flask. In fact, it's been evacuated of even air itself. So you're working inside of a vacuum chamber, you got an empty flask, you put water in there and you cork it, and then we watch what happens. And we'll monitor the, the pressure inside the flask using a pressure gauge. So this is telling us how many millimeters mercury of pressure that is registered in the flask. Uh, the pressure tells us how much gas is in there. So what happens as soon as you put the water in here is all you have is liquid water and some of these water molecules begin to vaporize into the vapor phase up here. And these gas particles, there's just a little bit of them at the beginning, are being detected with the pressure gauge and you see we're reading two millimeters of mercury. So that's not that much. So the chemical equation that describes this is written right here. The liquid water is vaporizing into the vapor phase and it's, it's going pretty quickly. And the rate at which it does depends on the temperature of the system and also the amount of water that's in contact with the space up here. So it depends on the surface area. If you wait a little while, uh, you're going to get more water up here and you're registering a larger pressure. The water vapor is still increasing. But now that you have a decent amount of water vapor up here, 10 millimeters of mercury, uh, the, there begins the reverse process of condensation. Some of these water molecules are bouncing around and they maybe get re-trapped into the liquid phase. There are uh, forces of interaction between water molecules that we'll talk about in the next chapter. And so some of these molecules, as they hit the surface, they just get re-trapped. And you have the backwards process occurring. But the forward reaction rate is still going pretty steadily. And since there's not that much water vapor up here, not many of them are yet recondensing into the liquid phase. So the reverse rate is pretty small compared to the forward rate. And since the forward rate is faster, uh, you're gonna continue to gain water vapor upstairs. If you wait a little while later, you'll see the pressure level off at 24 millimeters of mercury. And if you continue to watch it, the pressure does not increase after that. And what that's telling us is, is uh, let me raise this up a little bit. What that tells us is that the reaction has reached equilibrium. Once you have 24 millimeters of water vapor upstairs, then that's enough water vapor such that the reverse condensation rate 
matches the forward vaporization rate. And when the two rates are equal and occurring in opposite directions, they cancel each other off. And, and so as fast as you generate water vapor, it's going back to the liquid phase. And so the amount of water vapor doesn't change from that point on, and the amount of liquid water also stays the same. So this is equilibrium. By the way, the pressure at which this occurs is called the vapor pressure of water. So at room temperature, water has a vapor pressure of about 24 millimeters of mercury. If you change the temperature, the vapor pressure changes, but uh, this is a pretty well-known vapor pressure. So though the water still vaporizes and recondenses the amounts of water in the liquid and gas phases remains constant. That, that's the equilibrium situation. So it seems like the reaction has stopped, but we, we know that things are still happening. You know, if you were able to see the molecules, you would see them changing from the liquid to the gas phase and back. Let's look at a more interesting example. Chemical reactions are usually more involved than physical reactions. And here we'll look at the isomerization of glucose into fructose. Glucose and fructose are two different sugars which share the same chemical formula. And so their molecules are isomers of one another. The atoms are just connected a little differently in this molecule versus that one. Glucose is a six atom ring. Well, it contains a six atom ring. It has oxygen and then one, two, three, four, five carbons. So six atoms in a ring. And then fructose is a five atom ring. So the way this molecule turns into that molecule is, is this one right here detaches and it kind of reattaches as a shorter ring leaving off a little bit extra portion on one side so this is an isomerization reaction glucose molecules do this all the time and what helps the reaction occur is the presence of a catalyst the speeds of the reaction up the enzyme that does it is called glucose isomerase now, let's imagine this reaction is taking place inside of a, a beaker over here. And what we're gonna do for this experiment is we're going to add one mole of the reactant glucose into one liter of water. And don't forget the enzyme. You, you need the enzyme. So we have all of the material in here. And if you watch the reaction occur, if you're able to measure how much glucose and fructose is in there, if you wait a little while, you'll see that uh, some of the glucose has disappeared and you've generated some fructose. And then once the glucose levels have gone down to 0.48 moles and you've gained 0.52 moles of fructose uh, in, in turn, then it just seems to stop. After that, these chemical levels stay the same, and when everything seems to be staying the same, it's reached equilibrium. So this system reaches equilibrium roughly about after half of the glucose has reacted. Now, for a system at equilibrium, we like to quantify how much reactant versus product there is. And you can see it's about half has converted into product, but more precisely, we, we use this thing called the equilibrium constant. And the equilibrium constant is a number, a ratio, describing the proportions of products to reactants. And the way it's defined, its mathematical form, is the concentration of product material divided by the concentration of reactant material. So it's a, a, a simple fraction. You put the amount of product upstairs and the amount of reactant downstairs. Now these are concentrations, and though we haven't talked about concentrations much in this course, they're pretty simple to understand. They're basically the number of moles of chemical divided by the liters that it occupies. So 
So if we want to calculate the equilibrium constant for this system, we would need the concentrations of, of products, fructose and glucose. And we do that, or we get those, by taking the moles and dividing it by the liters that they're dissolved in. Well, this is a simple uh, situation because they're, they're both dissolved in one liter of solution. So the concentration of fructose would be 0.52 moles divided by one liter. That's 0.52 moles per liter. So we would put that upstairs in, in the equilibrium constant fraction. And the concentration of glucose, 0.48 moles over one liter, that's 0.48 moles per liter, that goes downstairs. Well, you can't see that. So that would go downstairs. And then now that you have the two concentrations in there that are really the same as the moles in this situation, you can do the calculation and you get 1.08 for the equilibrium constant. Now the equilibrium constant is just a number. It, it represents the proportions. And when the equilibrium constant is bigger than one, that tells you there are more products at equilibrium versus reactants. This is just a little bit bigger than one, so we would say that the products are slightly favored in this situation. When you look at the definition for the equilibrium constant, uh, since the products are upstairs and the reactants are downstairs, you, you can see that if the fraction is bigger than one, then the products would be favored. If it's less than one, then the denominator is bigger than the numerator, and in that case, the reactant would be favored. You'd have more reactant material. And if it's about equal to one, then at equilibrium, uh, you have about the same amount of products versus reactants. It's usually the case that it's, it's greater than one or less than one. Very rarely do you see it close to one like we do here. Now, there is a remarkable note that I need to mention before going any further. In any mixture, the reaction proceeds either forward or backward until the proper ratio of product to reactant is achieved. Okay, what does this mean? This means that suppose we we have a beaker and we just throw a little bit of glucose and a little bit of fructose in there. We're not looking at how much you put in there. So we're not sure what the proportions of products to reactants are. But this react, and, and don't forget the enzyme, of course. So this reaction mixture may or may not be at equilibrium. Chances are it's not if you just randomly throw in some of the chemicals. And so it's not the, the proper proportions. If you calculated this fraction, if you plugged in the products and divided it by the reactants, you wouldn't get 1.08, most likely. What happens is the reaction mixture somehow knows that it's not at equilibrium and it will shift itself. It will take some of the reactant material and convert it into product if that's required until it gets to the proper ratio of 1.08. And the reaction knows whether it needs to form more product or more reactant in order to get there. So these equilibrium constant numbers, you can think of them as kind of like magic numbers. If you, you just have the reaction inside of some beaker and it's not at equilibrium yet, it's going to get there. It will do what it needs to do until the proportions of products to reactants reaches 1.08. And that's pretty remarkable. Suppose we had just put a little bit of fructose in here. Well, some of the fructose would react backwards to reform some glucose and it would do so to the extent that the proportions of fructose to glucose matches 1.08. So pretty cool. 
Here's another example. Suppose a reaction mixture contains 0.70 moles of glucose, dissolved in a liter of water again, and 0.80 moles of fructose. So we, we've just thrown in some glucose and fructose. Let's look at these three questions. First of all, is the reaction at equilibrium? If not, what direction does it need to proceed in order to get to equilibrium? And then finally, what are the equilibrium concentrations after it does get to equilibrium? So three interesting questions. To tell if the reaction is at equilibrium is pretty simple. We just calculate the ratio of product over reactant and we see if it matches 1.08. We test the ratio. So the fructose concentration, we take the moles of fructose divided by the liters of solution. So again, it's simple because it's one liter. 0.80 moles per liter goes upstairs and then 0.70 moles per liter goes downstairs and then we do the calculation we get 1.14. So that's not quite 1.08. Now, when the reaction mixture ratio is bigger than the equilibrium ratio, that's telling you you got too much product in there. This number is too big compared to the equilibrium ratio, and it's too big because the numerator is too big, or maybe the denominator is too small. Either effect means uh, you got more product and not enough reactant. And, and so you got too much product. So to get to equilibrium, the ratio needs to change and the reaction must shift left, all right? Some of this fructose, some of the fructose needs to convert back to glucose. And what that's going to do is that's going to decrease the amount of fructose and increase the amount of glucose to the extent that the ratio becomes 1.08. So it's going to shift left. Now, the last question deals with how much does it shift? What are the equilibrium concentrations? Some of the fructose converts into glucose, but how much? Well, there's a couple of ways to approach this question. The first one is by trial and error. If you start with 0.80 moles of fructose and 0.70 moles of glucose, and you know you need to lose a little bit of fructose and gain a little bit of glucose in return, let's just try, uh, try a couple out. We're pretty close to the ratio, 1.14. It's pretty close to 1.08. So let's just subtract off 0 0.01 moles of fructose. So now we only have 0.79 moles. And what happens to that? Well, it turns into glucose. If you lose a little bit of this, then you're gonna gain a little bit of that. So this becomes 0.79 moles and that becomes 0.71 moles. And if you calculate this, it's 1.11. So we're closer, but not quite there. So let's remove a little bit more. Let's go down to 0.78 moles of product and 0.72 moles of reactant. And now the ratio is 1.08. And so these are the equilibrium concentrations. So that's one way to do it, trial and error. Another method is to create an equation. Uh, we know that the equilibrium amount of fructose upstairs is gonna be 0.80 minus a certain amount because you got too much product in there and you're gonna lose a certain amount in order to get to equilibrium. And likewise, you don't have enough reactants, so you're gonna gain a certain amount. Whatever you lose up here, X is gonna be what you gain down there. So this represents the equilibrium ratio and we set that equal to 1.08, which is what we know it's supposed to be. And if you have this equation and solve for x, it comes out to 0 0.02. So this is telling you how much reaction needs to occur. So you're gonna lose 0 0.02 amount of the, the, the fructose and you're gonna gain that amount of glucose. And so at equilibrium, you're left with 0.78 moles or, or 0.78 moles per liter of fructose and 0.72 moles per liter of glucose. 
So this method right here is more complex and we do that in general chemistry courses. Uh, it's not something we really need to be concerned with in, in this course, but it's interesting to see it. Here's, uh, let's see, another example. Cyclobutane decomposes to ethylene as follows. Here's the chemical equation. You have C4H8 converting into two C2H4 molecules. So what happens is this molecule, it, it breaks apart into two equal smaller molecules. So hopefully you see that. First, write the equilibrium constant expression for the reaction. Next, at equilibrium, are the reactants or products favored? And, and to answer that one, uh, you need to note uh, what the equilibrium constant is. I forgot, that's given to us right here. We're told what the equilibrium constant is for the reaction. So are the reactants or products favored? And third, if the concentration of C2H4, the product, is 0.1 moles per liter at equilibrium, then calculate the concentration of C4H8, the reactant. So first things first, let's write the equilibrium constant expression. Remember, equilibrium constants are product concentrations over reactant concentrations. So let's apply it to this reaction. So the products are C2H4, those concentrations are gonna go upstairs. And, and these concentrations are gonna be squared because of the coefficient two. So that's what you have to do when you have coefficients in the equation. The concentrations are raised to those coefficients as exponents. So we didn't have that before for uh, glucose and, and, and fructose. I'll, I'll show you the coefficients were, were one and one. So we didn't have to do that for, for, for this one right here. They're just raised to the one power. But now, in this example, we have a coefficient of two. So that concentration needs to be squared. Here is the equilibrium constant expression. Next question, at equilibrium, are the reactants or products favored? Well, the equilibrium constant is much less than one. And when it's much less than one, that's telling you at equilibrium, you have much more reactant versus product. If the equilibrium constants are less than one, the reactants are favored. That's the case here. So the reactants are favored for this reaction. Now finally, if you know what the what the equilibrium constant is, and you know the concentration of one of the chemicals, then solve for the concentration of the other one. Here, you're told the concentration of the C2H4, and you're asked for the concentration of C4H8. So what we do is we take this equation and we substitute in everything that we know. We substitute in K, and we substitute in the C2H4 concentration right there, and that gives us this. And now we're just gonna solve for the C4H8 concentration. And rearranging this equation a little bit and doing the math, we calculate that it's 33.33 moles per liter. And you can see that this concentration is much bigger than uh, the, the reactant concentration. And so, the, the C4H8 is, uh, I'm sorry, it's much bigger than, than the product concentration. Uh, so the, you, you got much more reactant material, 33 moles per liter versus 0.1 moles per liter of product. A lot more reactants. Reactants are definitely favored when you see small equilibrium constants. Now, how do you write the equilibrium constant expression for any chemical reaction? Well, you don't know what the chemicals are, but suppose you have some generic chemical reaction with a couple of reactants and they have coefficients little a and little b, and then you have products with coefficients little c and little d. The way that you would write 
the equilibrium constant expression for this would be the product concentrations raised to their stoichiometric coefficients, little c and little d, divided by the reactant concentrations raised to the little a and little b coefficients. And that's how you do that. So let's apply this to one more reaction here. Uh, actually, two more. Let's calculate the equilibrium constant for the reaction of hydrogen and nitrogen gas to form ammonia. The chemical equation is below. And we're giving the following equilibrium concentrations. So we're told what the, what the nitrogen, hydrogen, and ammonia concentrations are. These capital M's mean moles per liter. So that's the molarity, moles per liter. So we're told what the three concentrations are. We're given the chemical equation. We should be able to do this. First of all, in order to calculate the equilibrium constant, we need to know the expression for it. The equilibrium constant is going to be products over reactants. The products here are NH3, and so it's gonna be the concentration of NH3 squared upstairs. And then the reactants are N2 and H2 with coefficients one and three, so it's divided by the concentration of N2 times H2 cubed. Here's the expression. Now plugging in all of the concentrations where they're supposed to go and doing the calculation, we get 216.12, which rounds to 220. So you can see the products are favored here because the equilibrium constant is greater than one. By the way, this reaction is exothermic and it should be noted that exothermic reactions usually, not always, but usually favor the products. The reason for that is when you have an exothermic reaction, heat is released. Energy is being released. And that's like a stabilizing situation. When something releases energy, that think of a ball, uh, at the top of a hill. It's got a lot of gravitational potential energy. Where does it want to be? It wants to roll to the bottom of the hill. Okay, It wants to, to lose some of that energy. It wants to release some of that energy. And that's what chemicals like to do too. Releasing heat is sort of like the ball is rolling down the hill. So that's where it wants to be. Uh, the chemical reaction wants to go in the forward direction because it's exothermic and so the equilibrium constant is greater than one. So usually the case, not always. One more example in this video. Let's write the expression for the equilibrium constant given the chemical equation below. Hydrogen and iodine react to form hydrogen iodide. The equilibrium constant is 0 0.089 for this reaction. Now, if a two liter container has 0.1 mole of hydrogen, 0.1 mole of iodine, and 0.1 mole of HI, then is the system at equilibrium? And if not, then what direction does it shift to get there? First things first, let's write the expression for K for the reaction. We can do that, it's gonna be products over reactants. The product concentration is gonna be squared and the reactant concentrations just have it to the power one. Here it is. Now we can calculate the equilibrium constant because we're given the moles and the liters. We gotta take the moles divided by the liters this time. So for hydrogen, it's gonna be 0.1 moles divided by two liters, that's gonna be 0.05 moles per liter, or 0.05 m. And that will be the same as the other concentrations as well because they're all 0.1 moles in two liters. So all of the concentrations are 0.05 molarity, or moles per liter. So is it at equilibrium? Well, let's, let's check these concentrations. Everybody's 0.05 molarity, so let's plug it in right here, 0 0.05, 0 0.05, 0 0.05, and let's calculate it. Pretty easy to calculate. So it equals one, 
and that's definitely not equal to the equilibrium constant k. This is too big, and when the equilibrium, or when the ratio is too big, that's telling you, again, you got too much product material in there. So this is too big because the numerator is too big. You got too much product. So get rid of some of that product. You don't have enough reactant. Take some of the product, shift it over to the reactant side. It's going to react to the left to reform some reactant material in order to get to equilibrium. So hopefully that makes sense. If you do have too much product, the reaction shifts left to get to equilibrium. And likewise, if you got too much reactant, then it has to shift to the right to get to equilibrium. Before we go, I want to ask you one last question. What happens if a reaction is already at equilibrium and then extra chemical reactant or product is added? So you got a reaction mixture. It's at equilibrium. It's stable. And, and you disturb that stability by adding some extra chemical. Well, what happens? Does it stay at equilibrium? Is it not at equilibrium anymore? Well, we'll see how it affects the reaction mixture in the next video on Chatelier's principle. Stay tuned for that. Aloha.